Hello, this is Shmuel Moshe, and you are listening to the Weekly Parsha Cast, the weekly Torah portion podcast where I read the weekly Torah portion and then provide my own interpretation based on what I think it all means. This week's Torah portion is Parashat Devarim, which translates to the words, and it falls on the 6th of Av, 5784, August 10th, 2024. As always, if you'd like to follow along in English, I'll be reading from Chabad.org. And as always, I'd also like to remind everybody, I'm not a professional Torah scholar, just somebody who wanted to study the Torah. In any case, let's go ahead and jump into the first portion, Devarim chapter 1, verse 1. These are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel on that side of the Jordan in the desert, in the plain opposite the Red Sea, between Paran and Tophel, and Lavan and Hazerot, and Dizahav. It is eleven days' journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. It came to pass in the fortieth year, in the eleventh month, on the first of the month, that Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had commanded him regarding them. After he had smitten Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, king of the Bashan, who dwelt in Ashtarot in Edre, on that side of the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses commenced and explained this law, saying, The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough at this mountain. Turn and journey, and come to the mountain of the Amorites, and to all its neighboring places, in the plain on the mountain and in the lowland, and in the south and by the seashore, the land of the Canaanites, and the Lebanon, until the great river, the Euphrates River. See, I have set the land before you. Come and possess the land which the Lord swore to your forefathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them and their descendants after them. And I said to you at that time, saying, I cannot carry you alone. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, you are today as the stars of the heavens in abundance. May the Lord God of your forefathers add to you a thousandfold as many as you are, and may he bless you as he spoke concerning you. That's the end of the first portion. So here we are now at the time where Moses is giving sort of like a farewell address. That's what's going on here. It's now been 40 years and 11 months. So this is the end of their exile period. They're coming to conclusion, and we see where this is located relative to the local landmarks and settlements. They are on this side of the Jordan between here, here, and here. And basically, Moses is now beginning, and he starts by saying that you are going to be delivered to the land that you were promised to your forefathers, and you've been made multiple, right? God has fulfilled the promise to make you as many as the stars. So that is where you are now, but may he make you even greater. In any case, let's go on to the second portion. Chapter 1 of Devarim, verse 12. How can I bear your trouble, your burden, and your strife all by myself? Prepare for yourselves wise and understanding men, known among your tribes, and I will make them heads over you. And you answered me and said, The thing you have spoken is good for us to do. So I took the heads of your tribes, men wise and well known, and I made them heads over you, leaders over thousands, leaders over hundreds, leaders over fifties, and leaders over tens, and officers over your tribes. And I commanded your judges at that time, saying, Hear disputes between your brothers, and judge justly between a man and his brother and between his litigant. You shall not favor persons in judgment, rather you shall hear the small just as the great. You shall not fear any man, for the judgment is upon the Lord. And the case that is too difficult for you, bring to me, and I will hear it. And I commanded you at that time all the things you should do. And we journeyed from Horeb, and went through that all great and fearful desert, which you saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us, and we came up to Kadesh Barnea. And I said to you, You have come to the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. Behold, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it. As the Lord God of your fathers has spoken to you, you shall neither fear nor be dismayed. Thus concludes the second portion. So, At the time, we're hearing a recap of when Moses appointed the judges, and if we recall, this was actually a great piece of advice from his father-in-law, Yithro, Jethro, who said, you can't possibly deal with everybody's problems. You need to create a system where they can bring the lower issues to lower courts, and then if that needs to be elevated and so on, until finally, if they can't resolve it, then they come to you. So 
This was a very critical, decisive moment for the management of the problems of Israel, and Moses recalls how it happened. Interestingly, he does not specify where the idea came from, but nonetheless, there you have it. So he reminds them also this is where they were commanded, or how they were commanded, and now they have been uh, told, you know, don't worry, don't have anything to fear, because we've been on such a great journey. It was hazardous and perilous, but the Lord was with us. Now on to the third, chapter 1, verse 22 of Deuteronomy, a.k.a. Devarim, verse 22, And all of you approached me and said, Let us send men ahead of us, so that they will search out the land for us, and bring us back word by which route we shall go up, and to which cities we shall come. And the matter pleased me, so I took twelve men from you, one man for each tribe. And they turned and went up the mountain. And they came to the valley of Eshkol and spied it out. And they took some of the fruit of the land in their hands, and brought it down to us, brought us back word, and said, The land the Lord our God is giving us is good. But you did not want to go up, and you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. You murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hates us, he took us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to exterminate us. Where shall we go up? Our brothers have discouraged us, saying, A people greater and taller than we, cities great and fortified up to the heavens, and we have even seen the sons of Anakim there. And I said to you, Do not be broken or afraid of them. The Lord your God, who goes before you, he will fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes. And in the desert, where you have seen how the Lord your God has carried you as a man carries his son, all the way that you have gone until you have come to this place. But regarding this matter, you do not believe the Lord your God, who goes before you on the way to search out a place for you in which to encamp, in fire at night, to enable you to see on the way you should go, and in a cloud by day. And the Lord heard the sound of your words, and he became angry and swore, saying, If any of these men of this evil generation sees the good land which I swore to give to your forefathers, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh, he will see it, and I will give him the land that he trod upon, and to his children, because he has completely followed the Lord. The Lord was also angry with me because of you, saying, Neither will you go there. But Joshua the son of Nun, who stands before you, he will go there. Strengthen him, for he will cause Israel to inherit it. All right, there's the end of the third portion. So here we have it. Moses is now re recapping the idea of sending the 12 spies, right? And when he heard the idea, he was like, oh, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. Let's go ahead and do it. And, yeah, you even said the land was good and you brought back the fruit. But guess what? You also complained and said that the enemies there would be too great. You showed your lack of faith, and this made God angry. And so, except for Caleb and his descendants, none of you are getting in. And also, same with me, because of you, I also made God mad, and so I'm also now being cut out, but Joshua will be the one to go in my stead. So, make him strong, because he's going to lead the people. But other than that, everybody else, you're done for, as we have covered in the previous weeks. On to the fourth portion, chapter 1 of Deuteronomy, verse 39. Moreover, your little ones, whom you said will be prey, and your children, who on that day did not know good and evil, they will go there, and I will give it to them, and they will possess it. But as for you, turn yourselves around and journey into the desert by way of the Red Sea. Then you answered and said to me, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight according to all that he, the Lord our God, has commanded us. So every one of you girded his weapon, and you prepared yourselves to go up to the mountain. And the Lord said to me, Say to them, Neither go up nor fight, for I am not among you, lest you be struck down before your enemies. So I spoke to you, but you did not listen, and you rebelled against the command of the Lord, and you acted wickedly and went up the mountain. And the Amorites, dwelling in that mountain, came out towards you, and pursued you as bees do, and beat you down in Seir as far as Hormah. So you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not hear your voice, nor would he listen to you. And you dwelled in Kadesh many days, as the days that you dwelled. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then we turned and journeyed into the desert by way of the Red Sea, as the Lord had spoken to me, and we circled Mount Seir for many days. All right, so that's the end of the fourth portion. So Moses gives the other exception to the exile. He remarks, those who were too young to know better, those who did not know good and evil, they will be allowed 
to inherit the land. Those kids that you said would be taken as captives if you dared to try to take the land, well, they're going to be the ones to take the land. They're going to inherit it. So, oh, and let's not forget that after God said you're not getting in because of what you said, now suddenly you were brave enough to go and try to fight. But of course, God said, don't do it. You did it anyway, and you lost. They destroyed you. And so it's just a series of, you know, recollections once again. And once more, you know, they cried out, oh, Lord, help us. But he wasn't having it. He already told them don't do it, but they did it. And so they dwelled in Kadesh. Then they ventured back out into the desert toward the Red Sea or by the Red Sea uh, and circled Mount Seir. And now we're going to continue on to the fifth portion, chapter 2, verse 2 of Devarim, Deuteronomy. And the Lord spoke to me, saying, You have circled this mountain long enough. Turn northward, and command the people, saying, You are about to pass through the boundary of your kinsmen, the children of Esau, who dwell in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. Be very careful. You shall not provoke them, for I will not give you any of their land, not so much as a footstep, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau for an inheritance. You shall buy food from them with money, that you may eat, and also water you shall buy from them with money, that you may drink. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hand. He knows of your walking through this great desert. These forty years that the Lord your God has been with you, you have lacked nothing. And we departed from our kinsmen, the children of Esau, who dwelt in Seir by the way of the plain from Elath and from Etzion Gether. And we turned and passed through the way of the desert of Moab. And the Lord said to me, Do not distress the Moabites, and do not provoke them to war, for I will not give you any of their land as an inheritance, because I have given Ar to the children of Lot as an inheritance. The Amim dwelt there formerly, a great and numerous people, and tall in stature as the Anakim. They also are considered Rephaim as the Anakim, but the Moabites call them Amim. And the Horites formerly dwelt in Seir, and the children of Esau were driving them out. And they exterminated them from before them, and dwelt in their stead, just as the Israelites did to the land of their inheritance, which the Lord gave them. Now get up and cross the brook of Zered. So we crossed the brook of Zered. And the days when we went from Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the brook of Zered numbered thirty-eight years until all the generation of the men of war expired from the midst of the camp, just as the Lord swore to them. Also the hand of the Lord was upon them, to destroy them from the midst of the camp until they were consumed. So it was, when all the men of war finished dying from among the people, that the Lord spoke to me, saying, Today you are crossing the boundary of Moab at Ar. And when you approach opposite the children of Ammon, neither distress them nor provoke them. For I will not give you of the land of the children of Ammon as an inheritance, because I have given it to the children of Lot as an inheritance. It too is considered a land of Rephaim. Rephaim dwelt therein formerly, and the Ammonites called them Zamzumim, a great numerous and tall people as the Anakim, but the Lord exterminated them before them, and they drove them out and dwelt in their stead. And as he did to the children of Esau, who dwelt in Seir, when he exterminated the Horites from before them, as they drove them out and dwelt in their stead even to this day. But the Avim who dwell in the open cities, up till Gaza, the Kaphtorites who come forth of Kaphtor, exterminated them and dwelt in their stead. Get up, journey and cross the river Arnon, Behold, I have delivered into your hands Sihon the Amorite king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it, and provoke him to war. Today I will begin to put the dread of you and the fear of you upon the nations that are under the entire heaven, who will hear reports of you and shake and be in trepidation because of you. So I sent messengers from the desert of Kedemoth to Sihon, king of Heshbon, with words of peace, saying, Allow me to pass through your land. I will go along by the highway. I will turn neither to the right nor the left. You shall sell me food for money that I may eat, and give me water for my money that I may drink. I will only pass through by my feet. Just as the children of Esau who dwell in Seir and the Moabites who dwell in Ar did for me, until I crossed the Jordan to the land which the Lord our God is giving us. But Sihon king of Heshvon did not wish to let us pass by him, for the Lord your God caused his spirit to be hardened and his heart to be obstinate, in order that he would give him into your hand, as this day. All right, so there we go at the end of the fifth portion. So once again, breaking this down, we get some more stories about how they traversed the land. Again, this is sort of his recap farewell address. So we would hear about how they passed through the people of Esau on Mount Seir, but being that these were the descendants of Esau, they did not go to war with them, right? They were their brothers, in, in a sense. And also, 
they had been promised the land on that mountain as their inheritance. So when you go there, you're going to pay for the food, you're going to pay for the water, and you're not going to do anything that would cause them distress, basically. And you're going to go peacefully. And then also we see about the same deal, you know, depending on where you are, the same rules are going to be happening. So with the Moabites, you know, these are the descendants of Lot. So theirs is theirs to keep. And then same deal with the people of Ammon. Don't bother them either because their land is also given to them as inheritance from the descendants of Lot. But when it comes to the people of the Amorites, well, this is where things are going to be a little different. It was different because in this case, you're going to be provoking them to war and you're going to receive what's theirs. You're going to defeat them. You'll vanquish them. Same thing. We've got, you know, the story of what goes on with Sihon, king of Heshbon. Even though you give him the same offer that was made to Esau's people, he says no, and that is an excuse to provoke him into war. And so then they fight him, and he is defeated, and even says that his spirit was basically hardened by God to, uh, to, to do this. And so now we move on to the sixth portion, chapter 2, verse 31 of Devarim. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have begun to deliver Shihon and his land before you. Begin to drive him out, that you may inherit his land. Then Sihon went forth towards us, he and all his people, to war at Jaza. And the Lord our God delivered him to us, and we smote him and his sons and all his people. And we conquered all his cities at that time, and utterly destroyed every city. The men, women, and the young children were left over no survivor. Only the cattle we took for a prey unto ourselves, with the spoil of the cities which we had taken. From Aror, which is on the edge of the valley of Arnon, and from the city that is in the valley, even unto Gilead, there was not a city too high for us. The Lord our God delivered up all before us. Only to the land of the children of Ammon you came not near. All the side of the river of Yabok, and the cities of the hill country, and wherever the Lord our God commanded us. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then we turned and went up the way of Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, came forth toward us, he and all his people, to war at Edri. And the Lord said to me, Do not fear him, for I have given him all his people and his land into your hand. And you shall do to him as you did to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon. So the Lord our God delivered unto our hands also Og, the king of Bashan, and all his people, and we smote him until no remnant remained of him. And we conquered all his cities at that time. There was not a town that we did not take from them, sixty cities. All the territory of Argob, the kingdom of Og and Bashan. All these cities were fortified with high walls, double doors, and bolts, in addition to a many great unwalled cities, and we utterly destroyed them as we did to Sihon, king of Heshbon, utterly destroying every city, the men, the women, and the young children. But all the beasts and the spoils of the cities we took as spoil for ourselves. At that time we took the land out of the hands of the two kings of the Amorites who were on that side of the Jordan, from the brook of Arnon to Mount Hermon. The Sidonians call Hermon Sirion, and the Amorites call it Senir. All the cities of the plain, and all Gilead, and all Bashan, to Salcha and Edri, cities of the kingdom of Og in Bashan. For only Og, king of Bashan, was left from the remnant of the Rephaim. His bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbah of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was its length, and four cubits its breadth, according to the cubit of a man. And this land which we possessed at that time, from Aurer, which is by the brook of Arnon, and half of a mount of Gilead, and its cities, I gave to the Reubenites and the Gadites. And the rest of Gilead, and all Bashan, the kingdom of Og, I give to the half-tribe of Menashe. All the territory of Argob, all of Bashan, that is the land of Rephaim. Yair, the son of Menashe, took all the territory of Argob to the boundaries of the Gershurites, and to the Machatites, and he called them even Bashan after his own name, villages of Yair to this day. All right, so that brings us to the end of the sixth portion. So quite a bit here, we hear about the many conquests that they go on in the land, in between Egypt and the Holy Land. And so we find out that when he smites uh, Sihon, and all his people, right, so they have completely vanquished them, all the children of Ammon. Every man, woman, and child is slain, their cities are destroyed, and their livestock and spoils taken as their booty. From there, they also do the same thing in the next chapter. As they take these cities, they fight Bashan, or rather Og of Bashan, their king, and once again, another war that is complete and total annihilation for the enemy. Interestingly, uh, it says about Og that he is the last remnant of the Rephaim. 
So the Rephaim, this is a little tricky word here. If you look it up, it's referring to giants in some capacity, or it may even be something more, more ancient, uh, more pre-flood in nature. Regardless of the case, we see here his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. And is it not in Rabbah, the children of Ammon? Like, is it not there? Nine cubits was its length and four cubits its breadth. So they're saying this guy's bed was massive. So this dude was a giant. And look how big his bed was. Nonetheless, just as before, every man, woman, and child slaughtered, cities taken and captured, destroyed, and of course the livestock and the treasures taken as a prize. And the lands here, now that they've done all this work, goes to the tribes of Gad, Reuben, and half-tribe Menashe. And so it goes. Now moving on to the seventh portion, chapter 3 of Deuteronomy, verse 15. And to Machir I gave Gilead, and to the Reubenites and the Gadites I gave from Gilead to the brook of Arnon, the midst of the brook and the border, until the brook of Jabbok, which is the boundary of the children of Ammon. The plain, the Jordan, and the border thereof, from Kinneret to the sea of the plain of the Sea of Salt, under the waterfalls of Pisgah, eastward. And I commanded you at that time, saying, The Lord your God has given you this land to possess it. Pass over, armed, before your brethren, the children of Israel, all who are warriors. But your wives, your young children, and your cattle, for I know that you have much cattle, shall dwell in your cities which I have given you. Until the Lord has given rest to your brothers, just as he did for you, and until they also possess the land which the Lord your God is giving them on the other side of the Jordan, then every man shall return his possession which I have given to you. And I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings. So will the Lord do to all the kingdoms through which you will pass. Do not fear them, for it is the Lord your God who is fighting for you. All right, and that brings us to the end of the seventh portion. So once again, we just get a breakdown of the land distribution for the tribes on the other side of the Jordan, outside of the Holy Land. And reminder that all of those people of fighting age will continue into the land of Israel with their brothers from the different tribes, and they will conquer all of it. And then, only then, will they return to their wives and children who are staying in the now captured cities because those areas were great for livestock. They asked specifically if they could have that as their inheritance. So, a broad consideration, uh, another thing here before I go into that, you know, it says very clearly that Joshua was told, you know, see all the things that we just did to these two kings, you're going to do that to all of your enemies on the other side of the river. So, don't be afraid, don't fear them because God is with you. So what we're really seeing here is that the people of Israel are a conquering, warring people. They are moving in what is essentially a holy war in conquest in the name of God, uh, a crusade, if you will, to claim this holy land. It sounds familiar, doesn't it, historically? So I think there is a there's a biblical precedent, but I also think of other similar scenarios where this happens, you know, the Mongolians and their horde, and they would say the same thing, you know, well, we are doing this under the will of God. After all, if we weren't, why are we so successful? That would mean that God was not involved somehow. If, if it's not the will of God, then why are we winning? Would that mean God's weak, or does that mean God's actually with us? So I think it's really interesting. You know, there is this perception, I think, of, of Hebrews as not being a very strong, warlike people, but here we have a context of quite the opposite. Now, interestingly, it's not necessarily because they have the best tactics in the world, though with what has been said about Moses himself as a general before he was the leader of the Israelites and back when he was still in Egypt, you know, some stories say he was a very accomplished military commander. So it could be partly that, but ultimately it comes down to if God is with you, you're going to win the war. And if he's not with you, you're going to lose the war, right? We don't see many instances of, of an equal footing where the decisive outcome is not you know, preordained. In this case, it's you're fighting with God on your side, and the cities that are spared are the ones that God says you will be not harming. So that's what happens with those handed to the descendants of Lot and Aesop. But everybody else is pretty much done for. I mean, they're, and, and it's only going to continue this way when they get onto the other side of the Jordan. So I, I feel, you know, it, it's hard to talk about conquest, right? If you want to be a person who is civil, you talk about traditional imperial conquest or traditional, you know, marauders. I mean, imagine this large, massive nation of people that's just constantly moving, 
right? They're not sitting in one spot. So they're just constantly on the move and constantly just destroying and taking the plunder, right? I mean, really, that sounds a lot like Vikings or something. <laughs> like, what else could you describe it as? It's just this roving army of, of marauders that are taking what they take and defeating who they defeat. And they're not even taking prisoners. They're just killing them all, you know? And, and why? Well, this is because we're doing what God told us to do. So from a secular perspective, you know, this is definitely a very, uh, a very difficult thing to be hearing about because it just sounds like classic might makes right, you know, with a little God text sprinkled into it. But if you're looking at it from a genuine, if you, if you have genuine faith in the text that suggests that this is being done because God says so, well, otherwise, yeah, why would they win? Why, how could they defeat these people? Now, another thing to consider when they're sent into exile in the desert, right? You can describe this as being God's punishment, but I'm going to offer a more secular perspective this time because I'm curious about it. So, okay, they go to the land and they say, oh man, this is great and all, but the 10 spies tell us that we'll never be able to defeat those guys. So, you know, from a religious standpoint, Moses speaks on behalf of God and says, God's mad about what you just said, and we're going to go into exile for the next 40 years because of it. But by going into exile for those 40 years, you're going to build up a population that's even bigger than the one you have today. Now, miracles would suggest that you don't need a bigger population to achieve it, right? And it even says here at the beginning of this whole entire chapter of Devarim, you know, Moses points out that you've become as numerous as the stars. He didn't say that 40 years ago, right? 40 years ago when they had just come from Egypt, they were not as numerous as the stars, but now 40 years later they are. So, you know, that's 40 years of having babies and bringing up an army. That's a lot of people. So, you know, you could make an interesting argument about the numbers being relevant here, where it's, oh, we, we didn't invade because God punished us. Or you could say you didn't invade because you knew if you spent more time wandering around and supplying yourself on the rampage of conquest, that by the time you were ready to make your full-scale invasion, you'd have more army, you'd be more capable, and you'd be ready to go. But that is, again, that's a secular explanation for the same thing, which is God said don't go because you, you pissed him off. I mean, you could always just as easily say, well, if we're going now, we're going to win even with only 100 people against 1,000, right? Because that's exactly what the Torah says. If God is with you, it doesn't matter how many more people the enemy has, they're going to lose. Statistics don't matter when you're dealing with divine matters. So there you have it. In any case, that's the end of this week's portion of Devarim as we move into the fifth and final book of Moses. And uh, thank you for listening, as always. This has been a blast to go through and learn. And we don't get so much dialogue from Moses in a single go for quite some time, but this whole chapter was basically from the perspective of him. So very, very interesting to hear what Moses chose to highlight about their journey together. Nevertheless, until next time, this has been Shmuel Moshe with the Weekly Parashah cast saying thank you so much for listening. I hope you'll tune in next time, and I hope you'll keep on studying Torah. Until then, as always, I leave you with those two famous words. Baruch Hashem.